this is what we're here for. So if they get questions, let's talk about it. Um, so I'm going to talk from the animal side, and, uh, and Chris did a really good job helping you think about how your management affects the plant. And now I want to talk about how grazing management affects the animal. And we're really talking about this green leaf paradox, which uh, Chris already introduced. The green leaf is the primary source of feed for the animal, but it's also the primary source of food, plant food production, uh, for that plant. And so we've got to balance those two needs. When we talk about um, the animal and we talk about how we uh, affect animal performance, intake is probably one of the number one things that we can impact. The number two is, of course, plant maturity and thus uh, quality from that side of things. But intake's probably the number one thing that if we look at animals that aren't doing as well as we expect, oftentimes it's an intake limiter, not a quality limiter. Uh, overgrazed pastures, it's a result of overstocking, uh, which in turn diminishes their ability to, to essentially get enough in a bite. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and how that affects uh, forage intake and help you to think about what those optimal stocking rates look like. So uh, Chris kind of mentioned this idea of uh, continuous grazing. And with continuous grazing, if we stock it uh, at a very low level, we can allow those animals to select, right? And he's talking about you select those plants that they really like and they keep regrazing them well, their selectivity is really high. The quality of what they're grazing is really high, right? So their performance can be great. And so when we talk about continuous grazing versus rotational grazing, oftentimes we're not really talking about benefits from the performance side. Now, there can be, at the same stocking rates, there can be differences between the two. But really what we're talking about is productivity of the land. And so how much gain per acre can we get? You know, how, what's the carrying capacity per acre? If we manage that plant growth, we can get it to be more productive. We can carry more animals. And so it's all about a balance. There's, there's a point where we're actually undergrazing. We can get really good animal performance, but we have fewer animals, so we get less uh, amount of animals per acre, which means we get less productivity per acre. On the flip side, we can overgraze, we have a lot of animals, their performance is low, um, and so overall we also get low amount of gain per acre. And there's an optimum in here, and this is the sweet spot. I'm trying to figure out where that is for a piece of land and how to modify it, how to change it. For instance, how do we get more productivity from that land to where we can shift that curve up a little bit? So we talked about continuous grazing, rotational grazing. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page of what we're really talking about. We're going to also talk about strip grazing today. Now at the bottom of these, it has a description. Continuous grazing, animals have access to the total area. Everybody knows what continuous grazing is. Rotational grazing, it says six day defoliation and 30 day rest. Chris already talked about that's really just numbers. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, sometimes we, we can go for 10 days and, and we, can ha we need, uh, on other times, we need a 40 or 50 day rest, right? So when we think about rotational grazing, it is just that this piece of land gets grazed and then the animals get moved and they'll come back to it again eventually at some point in time. With strip grazing, one of the things about strip grazing is that we can increase the uniformity at which they're grazing. Right, so we can actually reduce selectivity. Selectivity here on continuous grazing, really, really high. Selectivity on rotational grazing, kind of medium. Selectivity on strip grazing, pretty much nil. Um, and so how we manage this, we can affect animal performance because we can affect quality they select, but we can also affect the amount of intake. 
The other one that I just kind of wanted to briefly mention, and we'll talk a little bit more about it at the end, but there's some ways we can affect quality of what they're able to select while still getting uh, more productivity per land base, and that is thinking about what are the requirements of my animals and maybe using that. And so they talk about first, last grazers. Um, the idea is essentially you take the animals with the highest requirements and you graze them through a rotational system first immediately followed. So you might do three days with your first grazers, they go to the next paddock and you bring in what they call your last grazers, which might be your animals with a lower requirement. So the first ones get to go in, they get to be selective, they move on, the next ones come in. You still want to keep that time period short, right? But they can come in and get the next class of, of forage quality and then you move them. Um, this is something you think about, I'm a beef person, just so you know, so I always think about beef. Um, this is something like I could use my replacement heifers go through first, or my first calf heifers go through first, and then my mature cows. Maybe I've got some thin cows, I'm trying to put a little uh, weight back on them. Instead of feeding them a supplement, maybe I do some grazing management and use this system to try to put a little bit more weight on them. So this is uh, something that adds some flexibility. If you already have a rotational grazing system set up, to me, this is kind of the next step. Um, if you don't, uh, probably just trying to figure out how to make this work is, is going to be enough of a challenge for that piece, those pieces of land. Because you'll find when you go and you split up a land base, you'll have this one patch, even though it's the same acreage, right? It's less productive than another one. You've got to kind of figure that system out before you add complexity on top of it. Chris talked about the disadvantages of continuous grazing. And he also mentioned horses are the worst. Um, I totally agree. I mean, they have teeth, right? So they're able to graze it down really, really low. So if we're talking about grazing management and the importance of grazing management with horses, it's, it's key. And it's the first, if you really want to see how much impact you can make, go work uh, in a horse paddock. Because your grazing management, you can see those differences really, really quickly. I've, nothing against horses, I'm just saying. They're really great at, uh, at selecting and they're really good at getting very, very low. Uh, I had a slide in here and I took it out of the different species. Horses are down at the bottom in terms of they can graze really extremely low. Cattle are up at the top, sheep are in between. Goats can actually get pretty low, but they don't want to, right? Everybody talks about goats as being they'll eat anything. That's not true, right? Goats are actually really, really picky. Uh, but you can force them to eat anything. Okay, so in the situation where we're talking about continuous grazing, probably the number one negative uh, from, the, from the animal side is just that you have a lot of waste, right? They soil something, they're never going to eat it. Uh, let, let something get a little bit mature like this patch, they're not going to go touch that. And so rotational grazing allows us the ability to reduce that potential. They still have some of that. I mean, in a rotational system, depending on how intense you get, you're still going to have some selectivity. There's still going to be some stuff that gets a little mature on you. It's just going to happen. But you can reduce that amount. The other thing is that with continuous grazing, he talked about you can change the species composition, right? They're going to go back and eat the things that they like the best. I call it the candy, right? They're going to go eat the candy, and when that candy comes back up a little bit, they're going to go back and eat that candy again, and you're not going to have any candy anymore. So if we want to manage such that we have those palatable species, uh, we have to do some sort of grazing management like rotational grazing. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit, the differences between the different grazing methods. And each one has advantages and disadvantages. In terms of selectivity, with continuous grazing, like I said, we can have really nice, high-performing animals and continuously graze them. We've got to stock it appropriately. Uh, but here's the negative. Forage wasted, right? 50%. We get a lot of forage waste. That means we have a low output per acre. And I don't know about you, but in, in Nebraska, uh, land is expensive, 
and pasture is extremely expensive. I can, I can actually lock a cow up and feed her for cheaper than I can graze her. And so if I'm doing this, it's even worse, right? We go to rotational grazing. We can cut back on some of the selectivity. We're going to lose a little bit of performance, um, not very much. We're going to cut back way more on the wastage, and so output per acre is increased. We go to strip grazing. Again, we cut back on sele selectivity even more, lose a little bit of performance potentially. Now, I say that. What if I'm grazing dry cows? What's the you know the, what's a requirement of a dry cow versus the requirement of of a replacement heifer? Come on, much less. Okay, see, I don't need anything technical here, guys. Just much, much less, right? So does it matter then? Probably not, right? She's probably going to meet her requirement even if you force her to eat everything that's there, right? So I can use that, right? I can use that to my advantage to increase my output per acre and cause her to eat those species maybe she didn't want to. And hopefully that helps me with some of my management like weeds, for instance. It's amazing how many weeds they'll actually eat if you make them. Um, and then I have at the bottom here chopping. We're in a grazing seminar. Why do I have chopping on here? Number one, it's the extreme, right? Very, very low selectivity, very, very high um, forage utilization, so low wastage. So why don't we all just do this? Fuel expense, yeah, machinery, right? Labor, I mean, if we go down this list, labor increases as we go down the list, right? Uh, this one's probably the extreme. So all of these have their places, but uh, this may not actually be optimum from the economic standpoint, and we all know it isn't optimum from the economic standpoint most of the time. Okay, I have three scenarios here. In each scenario, I'm going to give my herd uh, the same allowance, 6,000 pounds. But in one scenario, I have to give them more acres because my grass is shorter. Um, in another, it's really, really tall, so I give them less acres. Are they the same? How many say yes? animals would perform the same? No. Okay, he says, he says no. How many say yes? Nobody. How many say no? Oh, oh not sure. Maybe. Okay. Uh, all right. Most of the group says no. Why? Why would they not perform the same? Okay, maturity. So, in this situation, it's more mature. So what should that do? OK, so it's going to decrease quality compared to this situation. Uh, what else is going to happen? It says intake, though, will be higher. That's what you're saying here. Intake's going to be higher. Forage quality is going to be lower. The beginning of the session, what I say is usually the number one uh, predictor of animal performance. Intake, right? And you're right, forage quality can, in, uh, can impact intake, right? You get too low forage quality, you actually slow down how much can get through the rumen, pass out of the rumen, be digested, we can actually decrease intake. Um, in this situation, actually 2,500 um, pounds per acre, that's not very much, really. Um, that's probably a four to six inch, maybe, height. This is one inch in a, in a typical eastern stand. I am. Dry matter that exists above the soil surface, it's not, this is, this is, nope, so this is, I'm going to go put them into three different paddocks, this is what's out there, this paddock is bigger, this paddock is smaller, right? Yeah, so performance is not going to be the same, right? And I think he hit the nail on the head, and this one, 
we're going to have to have less bytes, right, to get the same amount of forage than in this one. And indeed, if we look at, this is actually with sheep. Oh, I'll use sheep as an example. See, I'm trying to be diverse. Um, if we look at, in this example with sheep, and the performance of those sheep, you can see that those who were put on that really short stuff aren't going to perform as well. Those who were put on the really tall stuff, even though it's a little more mature, it's still vegetative in this case. It's all about relative, right, amounts. Why? Why can they not? They had the same allowance. Why can they not uh, perform as well? So she says they spend more energy harvesting the feed. That's a good, that's a good one. Um, and that would be true. They have to, for instance, take uh, their intake is going to be lower, but um, their amount of bites that they have to actually take is going to be higher. And they're probably going to have to go further distances, right? There's actually some really interesting things about the number of steps that animals take during grazing, and they actually found the opposite of what I would have expected. That if we have a higher stocking rate, they actually take more steps to graze. I didn't expect that. It kind of makes sense if you think about it from the standpoint of that animal is competing with the other animals, and so it has to go find something, and it probably OK, everybody else has this around here, so I'm going to go over here. Whereas if they have a lower stocking rate, they're just going to set their head down and start going. I thought that was kind of interesting. In this case, I think you're right. They would probably take more steps. Um, but the big one is just all ruminants right, can only eat for so many hours in the day. What's the major limitation? They have to take time to ruminate. right? And so. They can only take so many bites in the day. They can speed up their bite rate a little bit to try to compensate, but they can only take so many bites in the day. And if we don't have enough uh, forage mass in that bite, we'll actually decrease intake and thus decrease performance. And so it's really interesting to me that uh, here, where this was actually like half an inch or something, their bite rate really wasn't, I mean, it was high, but it actually wasn't as high as it can get. My guess is that they were demoralized, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm just not getting anything. When they got to two inches, it was at its peak. And then as we went down from there, they were started decreasing their bite rate because they were getting more forage in them per bite. OK, the other side of it, we talked about managing the, the amount when we put them in in a rotational grazing system. And we want to make sure it's not too low from the animal side. We also have to make sure that we have enough uh, carbohydrates stored for the plant. What about managing the post-grazing mass? So if I, when I decide it's time to move them. So beyond thinking about how that impacts the plant, how does that impact the animal? And so this is actually an example of some calf grazing data. And it shows, essentially, that when we get below about 1,500 pounds per acre, we start seeing performance drop off. And again, this is partially uh, due to a decrease in their ability to just get enough in them. We also know that in some, to some extent, we're going to lose some quality, right? They're going to be trying to eat that bottom stem instead of getting leaf, which is higher quality leaf, right? But it's mainly intake driven. Um, so typically, if you think about uh, that example I just showed you, 1,500 pounds is, is two to three inches in a typical perennial stand that we might have. So if you think about it, this is not usually a problem if we're doing management for the plant, right? We're going to probably pull off, except for, I shouldn't say, OK, Bermuda grass is different, right? Bermuda grass at two inches is not 1,500 pounds. There's actually probably a little more out there. 
than fescue. So I'm, I'm getting, making some generalizations I probably shouldn't. Um, but in general, we don't have a problem with this unless we're in annual systems where we tend to have situations where there's a lot more bare ground, right? The thickness of the stand affects this. This is where it gets, to me, we usually have challenges because people think there's more out there than there is. If you look at 1,500 pounds an acre in, in many of our annual systems, that's, that's still like four inches. That's four or five inches because they're not as dense stands. Um, I was shocked the first time I went out and sampled some annual forages how little dry matter there was per acre uh, relative to the height. I did not realize, and it's, and it's mainly because we have rows, right, seven inch rows, and in between those rows there might be spaces, and you can have different row sizing, but this is where it becomes a challenge, and this is where we need to think about managing that, in my mind, is on annual systems. Um, we still have to manage it from the perennial side, but usually we don't have quite as much of a challenge. Okay, if we give animal daily um, allocations versus weekly allocations, what will we see in terms of intake? So this is an example actually on big blue stem, and this is the daily allocation curve over, over a month period. Essentially, you can see that about day 10, they hit their peak, and that would just happen to be due to the growing season, right? If we look at weekly allocations, it's very different. Each day, the intake differs, right, as you go throughout it. So this was much more consistent intake than if we gave the same amount but gave it on weekly allocations. Why do you think that is? Yeah, the end of the week, the grass is shorter, right? So you put them in, you have nice tall grass, they go in, they can select the high quality stuff, um, they probably set their head down more and they start grazing, they do their thing. Day three, now they're having to try to kind of find those spots, right, that they're looking for, that what's the good stuff that's still left here? Day seven, well, now I've just got to eat stuff, but it's all short, right? So if we think about how we affect um, animal performance based off of our allocation, what do you think is going to happen to performance? in this situation versus this situation. Oops. Yeah, the daily allocation um, in this situation would do better because we are giving them access to new stuff. Hopefully I'm not touching something, right? We are giving them the access to that new material. They are being able to be a little bit more selective in this case. Now it depends on how much you allocate, right? But relatively speaking, it would be more consistent. This is actually some uh, dairy cow data where they were giving them allocations uh, essentially once every eight or nine days. And just so you could see how their plain of nutrition actually fluctuated because milk production actually is uh, uh, quite responsive to nutrition, um, you can see that as you go throughout the grazing period, milk production increases, and then at the end of that grazing period, you had that milk production uh, come back down, then they got new allocation, it started going back up, so on and so forth. So most of the time, well, if we think about uh, grazing management, you, we don't see this, right? We don't see this in beef cows, we don't see it in sheep. Uh, we don't see it in the animals where we're trying to accumulate meat, but it's still happening. Their plant of nutrition is still fluctuating. And so uh, we want to try to maintain the best standard that we can, right? So how do we do that? Well, the more allocation we can do, the better. I say that that's a theoretical, right? 
what was the thing we talked about when we went down that list on strip grazing to chopping? It's all about labor, right? And so how much is this worth? How much is keeping that plain and nutrition higher worth? In some cases, it's not worth very much. If it's a dry cow, it's not worth a whole lot. Um, if it's a growing calf, it's probably worth a lot more. And so thinking about which ones do I manage more intensely, maybe I spend my time to manage those animals that have the highest requirements and are going to give me the most payback. Okay, so first and second grazers or first last grazers, I just wanted to kind of show you what we're really talking about here. If we had 10 paddocks, we would bring the first grazers in. They're going to top off. They're going to eat the candy out of it. And then we're going to try and bring in those second grazers to eat off uh, the rest of the material to get to our targeted uh, height or uh, targeted utilization. And this is kind of an example, and again, trying to do some diversity here. We had some growing lambs, um, let them go in and take the leaves off the alfalfa and then follow them with some uh, replacement heifers and let them eat the stems up, which is a lower quality material. So the idea here is that we can, we can ma manage such that we're using the same feed stuff but get more productivity per acre out of it. All right, just kind of summary here. Selectivity, animals are selective, right? They, they're just like us. They want to eat the candy. Well, some of us. Some people aren't really candy eaters. I am, unfortunately. Um, they prefer that young green forage, and that means if you stick them out in a field, right, that's what they're going to go for first. And if they give it time, a plant time to regrow, it'll have that nice young green forage. They'll go after it again. They are uh, selective in that they don't want to eat something they walked on. That's why one of the reasons why that daily allocation actually impacts uh, utilization because you actually, if you ever watch them, if you strip graze, right, as soon as you give them that new piece of, of grazing, they set their head down and start grazing, they don't walk all over searching. They get used to that idea and so we actually will avoid some wastage just from uh, decreasing the amount of walking uh, anything they urinate or any areas around the dung, they're not going to graze. And you shouldn't try to force them to do it. Um, so what we want to do is we want to try to uh, make sure that when we're managing our grazing, we're doing things such that uh, we realize that we shouldn't be using that as an indicator, right, of when to move. If you made them, forced them into that, then we know we probably uh, graze a little too hard. Number one thing that impacts animal performance is intake, and we can manage intake based off of how we allocate forage. That's the, uh, the message here. I'll go back to that. I think I caught us up on time. So now, Oh, he told you there was a break, so you know what that's going to mean. There's no questions, right? How much, like, wastage? Uh, I do not have any good numbers on what's the waste that's due to trampling versus the waste that's due to dung versus urine. Do you know of any numbers? I don't. And, it would be hard to measure, but if you go out and look, right, if you look at a field, I'm, I'm always intrigued. I can force them. Which ones will they eat first if I start trying to force them to eat something? What they trampled on, right? They'll go back to it if I make them. Um, but if, if I look at how much wastage we have, you know, one of the reasons why we have so high a wastage in the continuous system is forage maturity, right? Some spots get more mature. But the reason is they actually get mature is because they wouldn't select them first. Why would they not select them first? Either it was a plant species they didn't like, they urinated, uh, they had manure around it, or they trampled it. And so I would say it's not insignificant. It's more than I would have anticipated uh, just thinking about how much walking they actually do. And 
Yeah, I don't really know what that number would be. I wish I had a wish I had a number. Okay, you first. There's a, there's a lot of hype about mob grazing, right? And that's the idea, is that you're going to get a lot of trampling. But the truth is that when we think about uh, nutrient cycling in the soil, and their goal was building soil organic matter, uh, it's interesting that people overestimate how much of that litter is actually going to become soil-stable carbon versus if I have that animal eat it, I'm going to lose some, right? Because I lose carbon to the animal, I lose carbon as CO2, comes, there's some comes out as manure. The data does not support that mob grazing increases soil organic matter more than rotational grazing or even continuous grazing. And the reason I think that is true is because it's not a very significant proportion of soil carbon that comes from that litter. There's a lot that comes from roots, and there's also um, not an insignificant portion that comes from manure, because the manure actually uh, has a higher proportion of the carbon in manure that becomes soil-stable carbon. And so it's interesting. I think it was, a, it was one of those concepts that was worth looking at, but I don't think that the data supports those claims. And then, on top of that, I talked about intake being important, but what happens with mob grazing? They're going to let that forage get really mature. Well, what happens to quality? We're going to talk about forage quality. Forage quality goes down. And so I, I just don't know that the benefit and the negatives, I don't think they balance. But that's my opinion. And I might get shot by some other people. <laughs> I was not. I know there's been studies, one in Iowa and one in Nebraska, and both of them have not, sh not seen that soil organic matter benefit. Which so, so mob grazing is, uh, I don't know what they officially define it as, but essentially the idea is that I'm going to let the grass have uh, a lot of biomass out there, so I'm going to let it get really mature, and then I'm going to stock at a very high rate and move them very, very quickly, like maybe a half a day, um, at most a day kind of thing, and I'm going to have them come in, and essentially the idea is I want them to trample a lot. So I want that waste because I think it's going to build soil organic matter, but I don't think it does what they think it does. The, the data doesn't support that that's super beneficial from that standpoint. But you got something.
so mismanaged grazing versus mob grazing, yeah. But well-managed grazing versus mob grazing, no. So it's, it's all about, it's actually interesting. So I do mainly cropland work now, which is kind of different. And one of the questions I get a lot is actually on uh, cover crops and grazing cover crops and how will that affect the soil and my conservation benefits. And it's kind of intriguing that we were doing some work with corn residue grazing and we actually showed that instead of having a negative impact on soil organic matter, we were actually increasing soil organic matter with grazing of that residue. Why? Well, it, the manure was, yeah, the manure doesn't fly away. Yeah, you don't have uh, the husk in the fence row. That's probably, that's part of it, yes. And the other one is we saw an increase in soil microbial activity, which increased nutrient cycling. And there's some, there's some things going on there that's kind of interesting. Um, oh, for the, for the microbes in the soil. Actually, it's kind of interesting. The soil microbes, you're going to talk about uh, soil. Is that the next one? So you're going to talk about soil. The microbes in the soil and the microbes in the rumen, it's kind of cool that they're both microbe mediated. The nutrients that get to the animal and the nutrients that get to the plant, it's all dependent on microbes. So they're not all that different in terms of this ecosystem of the rumen and the ecosystem of the soil. It's kind of fun. I learned a lot like nitrogen carbon ratios in the soil and nitrogen carbon ratios in the animal. Not all that different in terms of thinking about balancing. Oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No, so think about, we talk about the animal, they're pretty good at selecting, right? They select the, the most vegetative material, the highest quality material. If I chop it, I essentially decrease the amount of selectivity they can have, which means that the quality of the forage they're actually consuming is lower than if I allowed them to graze and select. It's one of the... Uh, yes and no. What, so think about um, when they graze, you have stem and you have leaf, right? Those have different qualities. They're going to go graze off the leaves, right? If I chop it, I'm throwing that stem into the mix, right? Um, so if, if you think about the, the difference in, in grazing versus uh, chopping, it's actually one of my biggest nightmares is trying to figure out what animals are actually eating out in the pasture. As a nutritionist, trying to mimic their ability to select is, is essentially impossible. I can't do it. Um, I can put some animals out there that have fistulated rumens, right, and let them select and then sample it. That is always much, much different than if I go out and clip to four inches, right? And it's because they're able to pull off those pieces that are higher quality. I go in and chop, I'm just taking it all. And so the leaf to stem is probably the bigger uh, one, even beyond the maturity and their selectivity from that side of things, which they will do too. Um, but if I had a nice uniform stand, I was doing a really good job of grazing management uh, from, the si from the standpoint of like rotational grazing, I still would get um, a lower quality forage being chopped and fed to them than if I let them go out and graze it, even with like an annual.